Donc, ben bonsoir. On va commencer. Euh, donc, c'est la quatrième et, et dernière séance de en, au moins cette série euh, Paul Nurse, une série historique, je pense. On, on parlait avec Paul dehors et c'est la première fois qu'il a fait ces quatre séminaires. Euh, donc, c'est très c'est original. Et puis, ben, j'espère qu'il y aura une deuxième série. Bis. Yes. Okay. So, um, thank you, Paul. It's a huge pleasure to, to host you again for your, your last uh, seminar here in this series, at least. And, um, and today, I believe you are going to tell us how you reinvented the logic of the cell cycle. Not the logic of life, but the logic of the cell cycle. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it because, indeed, I think you're going to present us not only your, your research projects, but some unpublished data, too. And, uh, and hot off the press, so very excited. And over to you. Thank you. Do you need this as well? Yes, I need everything. Okay. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back here again. Thank you for coming. Um, um, what Edith said is, is right. So this is the final uh, uh, the talk that I'm going to give. Um, and it follows on um, from the one I gave a week ago, for those of you who were there. And you may remember I sort of left it with the, um, let's call it the accepted textbook model of um, how cyclin dependent kinases regulate the eukaryotic cell cycle. And I'm going to re-explain that at the beginning. And then I'm going to say I don't think that's quite right and that um, I think we have to re-look at it again. And I do realize that my own work contributed to the model that I'm now saying I don't think is quite right, um, but um, that's just how it goes. And um, the work I'm going to talk about, let's see if I can work. I've got this to go, but I can't find the arrow. Can anybody see the arrow? Ah, there, very good. So um, it was in the Francis Crick Institute. We have a logo. And this is a dynamic logo. Bang. Okay. I wanted to have a logo that looked nothing like an ancient university. And making it dynamic is, which, which it does not, of course, and making it dynamic, well, it is probably the most interesting slide in my talk. Let's just put it that not way. Ancient. Okay. Ancient yes. Yes. The more um, ancient you guess, the less mobile. Right. And this is the Francis Crick Institute, which I remind you all is only two hours and 15 minutes away from Eurostar. In fact, it's taken from the Eurostar terminal. So it's only 20 meters from where you get off the train or at least out of the station. Um, it's, um, it's a very friendly, welcoming place. We put it there to embrace continental Europe. Our government got in the way of some of that, um, but we're doing our best to counter it's barbarism, and they will move on, and something else will happen, of course, um, without any doubt. Okay, now, this is the, um, the test book view, uh, textbook view of the uh, cell cycle and the role cycling-dependent kinases, which are the major regulators, I think um, everybody or most people would agree. And um, it's it, literally a textbook, I think I stole it from Bruce Alberts' book, and what you see there is this notion that there are a range of different CDKs with um, different cyclins um, complexed with uh, CDKs. In the case of fission yeast, which is what I will be talking on, there's just one catalytic CDK. And the cyclins activate the CDK. And the notion is that um, there are different cyclins, G1S, S, and M, as you see there, and that they have um, major differences in their substrate specificities. So uh, the temporal order of cell cycle progression is determined by the appearance of different CDKs at different stages of the cell cycle. And those different CDKs have the different substrate specificities and therefore phosphorylate and activate the proteins that are required for the transition appropriate at that stage of the cycle. Um, for those of you who have would learnt that, in, that sounds roughly right, I think, as, as to what they, um, uh, what they say. And um, implicit in this 
is that um, there are waves of phosphorylation of substrates associated with different stages of the cycle. Often not specifically said like that, um, because it is a little bit um, on the vague side. And that's the model I'm going to uh, modify during, the, um, during this talk. Now, cycling-dependent kinase regulation is quite complicated. I'm not going to go through this slide. I just want you to run your eyes around all the arrows, and you'll see lots of words there. And each of those words reflects a different type of regulation. And the message of it is really relatively simple. There's a lot of different things going on um, to regulate it. One of which, which um, we will refer to in a, uh, I will do something within a moment, is that the cyclin has to make a complex with the protein kinase. Given that there's all these things going on, given that they get connected to all sorts of other um, components um, in the network, the, the modelers, because um, they like it, um, put all these things together, okay? And you get something a bit like this. Now, I hope it's too small for you to read, because I don't want you to read it. I want you just to look at it and to get sort of vaguely depressed. Um, it's out there. Um, they think it explains something, and we take nothing from it. And I got depressed looking at this stuff and thinking, what does it mean? You know, we've described a lot of things, we have no idea of how to put this thing together. And so should we re-look it again? And that was really the origin of, um, um, of this particular um, talk. Um, I, we did it in my lab, which is, works with fission yeast, which is a unicellular simple, uh, it's a fungus, a, 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 um, a eukaryote, which has all the major features, or at least the most important features, of other more um, uh, interesting and bigger eukaryotic cells. With respect to cyclin-dependent kinases, there are four different cyclines that, uh, that operate at the G1, G1S, and G2M boundary. Um, there is only one protein kinase encoded by the CDC2 gene, which I talked about last, uh, um, uh, last week, um, which many call um, a CDK1, cyclin-dependent kinase 1. So that's why I put it up there. And these different uh, CDK complexes are involved the cyclines PUC1, SIG1, SIG2, and CDC13. And this would be how a qualitative, what I would call a qualitative view of the cell cycle, um, emphasizing the qualitative differences of the different CDKs. Um, in a slide or two, I shall um, show the meiotic cell cycle, which has the same four CDKs, um, but also two, um, two specific for meiosis. So there's six uh, CDKs that operate in um, the meiotic cell cycle, which tends not to get studied very much, um, but we have done um, a little bit of um, study um, on there. Now, what I wanted to do here was to see whether we could simplify it further. And the uh, first simplification I thought of was to um, remove the controls that lead to the formation of a complex between the cyclin and the CDK by doing the very simple experiment of fusing the two genes together so that you have a single protein. So it's a first order reaction and it will just fold itself together. And um, a, a French postdoc came to my lab called Damien Cadrusa, um, and he did that experiment. And um, this is fission yeast. I wanted to show it to you. It looks like a, a nursery chocolo, although it's bigger, wild type there on the left. And what Damien did was to experiment with different fusions, different linkers and so on, till he got something that was reasonably working reasonably. That's CDC13. That's the G2M cycling, right? The G2M cycling, a linker and CDC2. And he deleted CDC2 and deleted CDC13. And you see the cells there look perfectly normal. They have a normal growth rate. They go through the cycle. And for those interested in greater proofs, you can see the fusion protein there um, shifted up the gel. Now, that, if you interpret it literally, would suggest that that uh, single CDK is um, promoting progression through the cycle, because any other cyclins that would try and complex with CDC2, given that it's deleted, 
um, would not be a first order reaction. But just to prove it, he went through and deleted SIG1, SIG2, and PUC1. This is one of the beauties of working with fission yeast. You can do experiments like this. So now we have no mitotic cyclings at all. We have no CDC2. We just have the fusion protein, and it's a perfectly normal cell cycle. Now, this is not consistent with the model I showed you um, about four or five slides ago. What it um, suggests is is that you can drive the entire cell cycle with a single CDK. Um, that's for mitosis. Another postdoc, this time from Spain, called uh, Pilar Escribiano, um, looked at the meiotic cell cycle, which you can also do in fission yeast, um, where there are two other cyclins, CRS1 and REM1. That's in red and, 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 and green. We did a bit of work to see where they were thought to act through the cell cycle. And, um, Essentially, we deleted those two genes as well, and if we upped the expression of the um, fusion protein, then the cells could perfectly well undergo the meiotic cell cycle as well. So we could drive both the mitotic and the meiotic cell cycle with one cyclin-dependent kinase. Has to be said, nobody takes much notice of it, but they will do in um, a little while, I think, for, because it's gradually emerging as I will show you, that, um, as or I won't show you, I shall bring to your attention, um, that um, it, it's relevant to um, it, um, cells including our own. How can you explain this? Well, you can explain it by what I call is a quantitative model. Whereas the different CDK, um, say, the, the, the periodic arising of different CDK activities is... is uh, built upon qualitative differences in substrate specificities. If the whole thing is driven by one CDK and you have temporal order of events, then the only thing you've got left with is quantitative properties. That is the level of the cyclin dependent kinase. So a fundamentally different way of thinking about this. And um, I have laid it out on the right hand side there. Um, with um, CDK activity increasing through the cell cycle. When I drew the, this, which is some years ago now, we didn't actually know the pattern of CDK activity through the cycle. We now do um, from single cell analyses, and you'll see examples of that towards the end of the talk. But um, it doesn't really matter for this, the pattern. What matters only is you start with a very low level of activity and it goes up to a high level of activity. That's what we proposed. And when you reach a sort of um, a, a, a lowish to a little bit higher activity, you undergo S phase. When you get into G2, having completed S phase, we also speculated that the increased activity inhibited S phase, because that would immediately mean you only had one S phase per cell cycle. And then when you get to a higher level, then you would undergo mitosis. And then cycling gets degraded, as was shown by Tim Hunt, um, working with um, sea urchins, and Marcel Dore, as I said, uh, um, those who know him working with starfish, and the, cells, the whole thing starts over again. Now you'll see one of the uh, um, features of this is it could not be a simpler model compared with what we had before. And being British and simple, I like simple things, and it's a very simple model. And you see it laid out in the circle where the level of uh, pink and redness reflects the level of activity. When you have no activity, uh, you get a bit more, you go S phase. Um, you get a bit more, you block S phase, you get more, you go into, um, my, uh, you go into mitosis. Now, how could we test such a model? Well, we could exploit the, um, um, the, the beautiful thing invented by Shokat, um, who, what he did is he mutated the ATP binding site of protein kinases so that the binding um, cleft is made bigger. This meant that a, um, a, an ATP analog, which is bulky and will inhibit that kinase, can get into that cleft, but not into any other protein kinases. You, you see how that could work. So by creating that mutation, um, or mutations inside the um, CDC2 protein kinase, and then adding a, a shock at inhibitor, then you will specifically inhibit that particular protein kinase. And 
Um, you get off targets if you go to a high concentration, but if you keep at a reasonable concentration, you do not. And what this meant was that we could use it in vivo to adjust the level of CDK activity in vivo in cells. You add more inhibitor, you have less CDK activity. And the notion was that if this is true, we would need different levels of inhibitor to block onset of S phase and onset of mitosis. And if we could manipulate it properly, maybe we could reset a G2 cell and make it undergo S phase again. So we reorder the cell cycle. And that's what I'm going to tell you about here. We have cells here um, synchronizing G2. They are released into mitosis. The control is DMSO, and you'll see the black line with triangles. These are cells in mitosis. You'll get a beautiful wave of mitosis in the second one a little later. NMPP1 is a shock at inhibitor, um, and the shockatized CDK will respond to... Oh, I've, caught, I've, tur I've turned his name into a... Into a um, an adjective really shock at times. Um, but um, if you add increasing amount of inhibitor, you'll see that initially you s delay the onset of mitosis, and then when you get to 300 nanomolar, um, it can't go into mitosis at all. If you go 100, you get a little bit of mitosis at the end. So somewhere between 100 and 300 nanomolar is the level of inhibitor you need to block the G2 to mitosis transition where you need a lot of uh, CDK activity, so a small amount of inhibitor will work. Um, this is, by the way, a 0.1 micromolar or, and 0.3 micromolar, because we need that for the next one. Then we look to see um, what concentration you needed to block onset of S phase. And these are now, these are a series of facts analyses where we've measured the percentage of cells at different stages of the cell cycle. And basically, um, we've got synchronized cells going through um, uh, the, the, the cell cycle, and the G1 is very, very short, and the way that we've set this up, you, you don't even see it. So DMSO, um, cells go immediately in, in, uh, into, two, into um, to, uh, 2C, 4C, and you don't see any cells in G1. However, if you add now one micromolar, you see a short peak of 30 minutes of arrest in G1, and then it gets through. 2.5, you can see, is longer. Um, 5, you can see there, is about 90 minutes. If we go to 10 micromolar, which is the maximum that we like to do in these experiments, you go to about 150 minutes. So to delay S phase requires 5 to 10 micromolar, whilst to delay mitosis is um, much, much lower at 0.1 micromolar. So we don't know what that means in terms of CDK activity, but we know that it's much greater activities required for mitosis than for S phase. The most entertaining experiment is can we persuade these cells to re-replicate? And this is a, an experiment where we block cells in G2, um, and uh, that's you've seen on the left, and then we treat cells with a 10 micromolar pulse of that inhibitor. Now, if you remember that uh, you're in G2, you have CDK activity, you add that inhibitor, you force the, act the uh, activity down, and then we wash it out so it comes back up again. So if the model is true, that will reset the cell cycle, so it will now undergo S phase instead of mitosis. And you see that happens here, because these cells are too C. They, um, when we wash it out, they um, reset themselves and undergo DNA replication. And of course, there's an implication to that. What it means is there's no real arrow of time in the cell cycle. You can actually set where you go simply by manipulating CDK activity. It's not hardwired into what's happening. It is actually a consequence of the regulatory system, which is driven by the cyclin-dependent kinase. So not only is it rather a simple system, but it provides a simple explanation for those basic features um, of, the, um, of the cell cycle, of how you order S phase and mitosis, and how you, in fact, block onset of S phase, so you only have one S phase per cell cycle. Because when you complete mitosis, you kill all the activity, you go back to G1, and now <coughs> you can undergo um, S phase. 
John Diffley, who's my colleague in, uh, um, in, the, uh, in the Crick in Budding East, uh, um, some years later than this, um, identified a couple of the proteins, SLD2 and 3, for those that are interested, um, that are uh, um, uh, targets for the um, blockage of, um, of, of the, of the um, S phase. Now, given that result, we should see a different, um, if I just go back to here, we should see a different pattern of um, phosphorylation of uh, CDK substrates. They shouldn't go up in waves, which is what you expected qualitatively. They should go up and um, not go down again because it, they, they continue to be phosphorylated. So um, that was tested by um, Matthew Swaffer, a graduate student in my lab, and um, Andrew Jones, a, a technician in, 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 in our lab. These are synchronized cells. We've grouped everything together just to show the point. And light blue is the S phase CDK substrates, that is substrates that get phosphorylated early in the cycle. And you'll see they immediately arise, but they keep rising. It's not a wave. It, 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 it goes up, so proteins get phosphorylated, but they remain phosphorylated. That isn't really consistent with waves. Um, and of course, mitosis occurs, as you see, at the very um, end of the um, uh, end of the ex of the uh, 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 of, of the cell cycle as they go into mitosis. Now we can do some more interesting things than that because um, using the NPMPP1 inhibitor as a sort of measure of sensitivity of the CTK substrates to activity, we can um, uh, measure the phosphorylation of, for example, those mitotic and S phase CDK substrates in cells that we've treated with different levels of the inhibitor, and then get something out a bit like an IC50, for those uh, familiar with these things. And what you can see is um, that the mitotic substrates, which are um, the heavier black line, um, become um, dephosphorylated um, at around 100 um, uh, nanomolar, um, consistent with what I showed before, by the way, whereas the S phase ones require something like 3,000 nanomolar um, to, uh, to stop the phosphorylation. So we can now equate what we saw before biologically, S phase and mitosis, to the extent of phosphorylation in those substrates in S phase and M phase. Now we can also use this trick to measure in vivo um, protein kinase activity which is actually more generalizable, of course, because, and it's really do, just doing in the in vivo biochemistry. Uh, um, it's very simple. We take cells with the um, shocker, shockerized uh, CDC2, um, cyclin dependent kinase. We treat it, um, um, those cells, for 10, 15 minutes with the uh, inhibitor. And because, and I haven't shown you this, because the turnover of phosphate on the substrate is very fast, around two to three minutes only, just two to three minutes. Within 10 minutes, it's all dephosphorylated. So what we have is in vivo cells now full of substrates, hopefully still in the right places and not disturbed or anything, um, which are now dephosphorylated. Then what we can do is just wash out the inhibitor, just like you're doing a protein kinase activity and adding ATP. The kinase activity comes up, and now you can use the mass spec to measure phosphorylation to the substrates. And this allows you to measure hundreds of substrates simultaneously in each um, uh, extract. So for those protein kinases, of which CDK is one, which have many substrates, this is a very useful um, tool that can be used. And you'll see uh, the, um, uh, what we saw there. If you look um, at the top left um, in um, different um, phases of the cell cycle, because um, we, we did this at G1, cells in G1, S, G2, and M, that the amount of phosphorylation that can occur in G1 of all those substrates is far, far lower. I mean, it's the green versus the blue line, 50 to 100 times less, in fact, than those at mitosis. So, and as you go through the cycle, you see a gradual increase in the CDK activity. Um, we derived from the top one I instantaneous phosphorylation just to show it a little bit more uh, clearly. Also, we can now look at the substrates in there, 
and look to see what happens to substrates that are labelled early in the cycle, mid in the cycle, or late. And you'll see the early ones get phosphorylated much more readily than the, um, than the, uh, than the um, other ones. So this led then to this model that actually the primary driving rule of uh, bringing about temporal order is simply rising CDK activity, phosphorylating different proteins because different proteins, substrate proteins, have different sensitivities um, to CDK activity. So at very low level, you phosphorylate the early, at higher level mid in the middle of G2, late uh, the mitotic ones. And on the right there, you see um, the CDK activity increasing as you go to the right and phosphorylation in the different types of um, substrates. So this is strong support for the quantitative view of the cycle. But there was something that really bugged me, irritated me about this. I told you that we could get the whole cell cycle driven by the G2M CDK, CDC13, CDC2. If this model is completely correct, um, that is to say there's no significant difference in the um, substrate specificities of G1S and G2M CDKs, I should have been able to get the G1S CDK, which is SIG2, to also undergo mitosis. And we tried that in a variety of ways, and it could never do it. And so that implied that there was something significantly different, and so argued against this quantitative model. So we had data of this sort, but we had this in the way. So um, a, another graduate student in my lab, Saz Basu, who's actually just graduated um, a, a few months ago, set up a system to investigate this. And what he did was, um, is shown here on, on, on the left, he created a strain which was temperature sensitive for CDC2, CDC2 M26, a mutant that Kim Naismith and myself isolated in 1975, I think, and it's a, a really good uh, TS mutant. And then he put, so that means we could kill all CDK activity in the cell, and then put under a TET promoter a cyclin CDK1, and in this case it would be the SIG2 cyclin, um, and we had a GFP so we could measure the level of protein um, tagged to it, um, under the TET promoter, so that we could, uh, um, we could just switch it on and substitute the CDC2 M26 with that particular construct, uh, which would allow us to investigate it. We put in a sensor for measuring mitosis, um, which we don't need to worry about. It just tells you whether you've got into mitosis or not. And what SAS then investigated was the following. What he wondered was whether the SIG2 CDK1, remember this is the G1S CDK, whether that's subject to negative regulation which inhibits the activity, doesn't change the, um, the uh, substrate specificity, but reduces activity. And that if we could um, remove that, maybe it would work. And we had four potential ways in which it could be regulated. Um, it's, it's all around there. He, he, he um, de deleted them, so it's, um, it was all, um, all, all clear. And this is the experiment that you see here. On the left-hand side, B, what we have is the control, is a dark blue. Here we've expressed the CDC13, G2M CDK, and we get a perfectly good peak. Then we express uh, SIG2, we do not. So it doesn't work, right? And then he went round and deleted all the um, negative uh, uh, elements there on the left and found if he deleted phosphatase PP1, we then got not a perfect, but a reasonable peak of entry into mitosis. So that indicated that SIG2 CDC2, the G1S CDK, could get you into mitosis, could get you through mitosis, in, in fact, albeit a bit slower, albeit a little bit less um, efficiently. Well, um, Saz then looked into that and thought, well, um, how could it be working? And he found a paper from an ex-graduate student of mine, actually called Ian Hagen. And um, Ian had shown that um, PP1 is located in the spindle pole body, phosphatase PP1. It's elsewhere too, but it's in the, the spindle pole body. And the spindle pole body 
is the centrosomal equivalent in fission yeast. It's where you organize the microtubular um, spindle. And what um, Ian had shown is that PP1 could be in, in, rejected from the spindle pole body um, if uh, another protein there called CUT12 was mutated on two sites, okay? Um, it got phosphorylated on two sites. So if that's mutated and made uh, um, a, a, a phosphoanalog with aspartate, PP1 didn't go to the spindle pole body. It wouldn't be resigned there. Now, we had shown years ago that, um, that CDC2 was located in the spindle pole body, so he made a leap and said, maybe it's the phosphatase one is working there, and if we, reject the, if we eject the PP1 from the spindle pole body, now it can work. And I wouldn't be telling you all of that if it didn't work. And that's down the bottom here, and in those mutants there, uh, the ones in CUT12, which um, ejects the PP1, uh, you'll see now the light blue is the uh, control, um, CDC13, CDK1 is the dark blue, and the black is the uh, experiment here, which is now running on SIG2 CDK1, and it's a perfect mitosis. So that tells us several things. It says now we can bring about mitosis with SIG2, CDC2. So the thing that was irritating me has gone away. And I can now feel confident about it and happy about it. Um, it also says that the centrosome is playing a key role for mitotic on, um, um, uh, uh, onset. Now, some of you may know Michel Bournens, who unfortunately died earlier this year, but he'd been arguing the importance of the centrosome as a cell cycle core place um, from experiments from Bovary onwards um, for over a century. And um, I wish he'd been still alive because I was going to send him this stuff um, to... Uh, in fact, I'd written to him before he died and said, you're going to really like this, but um, I, I, it, it didn't work out, so I was very sorry um, obviously, about that. So that's the model. Now, we also could now ask, OK, if that's true, we can now use phosphoproteomics to look at the, um, the, uh, uh, the substrate phosphorylation of um, uh, identical levels of the two proteins, CDKs, for a whole range, uh, uh, 200 substrates, and compare directly in vivo what the rate of phosphorylation is. This is the advantage of the mass spec um, approach. And here, I, I really was astonished by this. You, the, down here, we see the numbers of, uh, that we, uh, we, we were measuring, which is about 250 sites. On the left, the, by far the biggest, 180, you'll see a comparison between the G2M CDK and the G1S CDK are the dark blue and the light blue. And they just sit completely on top of each other. They are almost identical. This was a cluster analysis um, that would do that. And the majority of these proteins are mitotic, which, of course, the G1S CDK is not supposed to even be interested in, in the conventional model. So the majority, by far, um, are um, um, identical. Now, if we look across to the right, you'll see that in the next cluster, 31, which are nearly all mitotic proteins, SIG2 is actually a better kinase than the G2M kinase. If we look over to the right, that's also the case. And there's just 36, number three there. I don't know why Saz did it in this order, but he did, so I have to jump and go back. Um, you'll see that is the only 36 proteins that are in the cluster analysis there where, in fact, CDC13 exceeds CDC2. And if you actually now look at those light blue ones, there's only 10 there where the, the uh, specific activity is less than 30% of, um, the, um, uh, of, of the G2M CDK. So what this demonstrates is that in vivo, the CDK substrate specificities are almost completely identical over hundreds of um, substrates. Um, despite the fact that these must have diverged from each other quite a few millions of years ago. We calculate um, um, probably um, 100 million years ago. This is the next mystery, which you can, we can discuss later. Okay, so now um, that made me feel 
happy about the quantitative model and also struck with the extraordinary similarity, which is in no sense consistent with the model that is now in the textbooks, which I do think has got to take account of this. Now, the centrosome, therefore, is quite interesting here. And um, one of the things that I used to talk to Michel about was, was the centrosome a hub for CDK activity? And I thought maybe that substrates that are difficult to phosphorylate, they have low substrate specificities, are perhaps put into the centrosome, the spindle pole body, so they are concentrated with CDK activity, so that if they have low um, specific activities, you can still phosphorylate them. And that's what this next little bit is about. But it didn't start there. It started because in budding yeast, there is a story based on in vitro um, CDK activity only, that actually the qualitative model is what works. They purified different proteins and, and so on, and, and from, uh, which are G1S and G2M. And they identified a motif called a hydrophobic patch in the cyclin, which um, was, um, uh, they argued was, uh, was necessary um, to bind the G1S substrates, okay? And so we wanted to check, because we had a completely different view of it, what the effect of that was in um, vivo. So this was done by Saz and my another graduate, my lab is nearly all graduate students, by the way, um, by another graduate student, Emma Roberts, who was examined only last week and passed, you'll be pleased to hear. And uh, she looked at the, um, it's mainly her, she looked at the hydrophobic patch, which you will see is conserved from human um, to yeast, and we tested, because that had been shown to be essential for the phosphorylation of G1S substrates in vitro, in proteins from budding yeast. And so we asked if it was essential uh, to go into S phase. In other words, we did an in vivo assay. And it wasn't. In other words, what you can see there, and this is synchronized cells going through, and this is fat cells and going from 1C to 2C. And what you can see on the third um, um, uh, uh, series of, of, of Time, the time course, that is a CDC13, it's a fusion protein, um, and the HPM mutant is perfectly capable of undergoing S phase. So the in vitro work doesn't correspond to this. The criticism of this experiment is we've done this on a G2M cycling, and so there could be some difference between the G1S, and we are setting it up to do the G1S, but we haven't got the results for that one yet. Um, but at the moment, we suspect it won't be required for that from given this result. Now, however, the HPM mutant couldn't undergo mitosis, okay? Um, despite the fact that in budding yeast, they thought that it, could un it would phosphorylate mitotic proteins. So what you saw here is that uh, you don't really have to work your way through it. Look at the bottom here. These cells are elongating. They can't undergo mitosis. They, they're blocked in in um, cell cycle progression. So the HPM mutant, the hydrophobic patch mutant, um, uh, can undergo S phase but cannot undergo um, mitosis. Now, why is that? Well, um, to cut a long story short, um, what we discovered was that the HPM um, mutant in the cycling was necessary for the CDK to be targeted to the spindle pole body during G2 in preparation for mitosis. And you can see that um, if you just look at the top layer of cells to the left, I hope you can see it, I, I think you probably can. Uh, the arrows uh, identify a dot on the side of the nucleus, that's the spindle pole body, we showed that with uh, another antibody, uh, uh, another uh, uh, tag protein down below. And you'll see that in short cells, which are in G2, you see um, staining, and then you can see mitosis. If you look to the right, and these cells have actually got wild-type CDC13 in there, but it's not tagged, you'll see that the, uh, the HPM uh, cyclin mutant cannot get associated with the spindle pole body until just the onset of mitosis. And it's brought there, um, we think, by um, a, a, another mechanism dependent upon polo um, uh, the, the polo kinase. So the HPM motif has a role in um, getting the, um, the CDK and the cycling in particular to the spindle pole body in G2 to prepare you for mitosis. 
And if you can't, um, if you mutate that, you can't do that, and so the cells don't undergo mitosis. A completely different explanation to the one that um, was developed for G1S specificity. Once again, we turn to phosphoproteomics to see the impact of that. So now we can ask the question, um, what substrates and how do they get phosphorylated in uh, a wild-type cells, which of course we already knew, and the HPM mutant? And what you can see here is again a, 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 a cluster analysis, and we're looking at um, clusters of 67, 11, 76, and 17 proteins. And what you'll see with nuclear and nuclear envelope, there is no difference between the, the two versions of cyclin. But now when we look at what's called cytoplasmic ones, you'll see there is a definite reduction in the HPM mutant. And that is seen, pleasingly, in a, most ext in a fourth category in the most uh, 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 um, uh, uh, obvious case, um, in 17 proteins found in the spindle pole body. So all of this is consistent. What it suggests is, is that um, the uh, HPM mutant cannot efficiently phosphorylate proteins in the spindle pole body and quite a few proteins in the cytoplasm. And the question which Michel would have asked me is, were those phosphorylated in the spindle pole body and then went into the cytoplasm? And we've done an experiment which now allows us to test that because we've targeted CDC13 not through the HPM mutant but um, through a tag and we want to see if we rescue that or, or don't rescue the cytoplasm. Because it also could be a motif in the cytoplasm. So I can't tell you the answer to that. Now, going back to why we set this up. This is doing the IC50 again um, to ask whether those um, uh, uh, substrates um, which are most difficult to phosphorylate are actually those that are in the spindle pole body which you need to be, um, and therefore are HPM, um, hydrophobic patch dependent. And you see the answer is yes. The red are all those that are in the spindle pole body, and they can be inhibited with a low level of uh, inhibitor. The blues, which are HP in, in, um, independent, um, uh, require a higher level. So the, uh, at least it's consistent with the view that those proteins in the spindle pole body that are phosphorylated actually are difficult to phosphorylate, that's what this experiment shows, and maybe the spindle pole body is indeed um, um, acting as a hub. Okay, okay so far, um, good. Gets a little bit simpler now actually, because um, I'm now going to ask a series of questions which we don't have the answers to, all right? And these are the problems that we are interested in. And I'm gonna lay them out here and say what we've done to them um, but we, we don't answer any of them satisfactorily, okay? So it's an identification of the issue. Um, the first thing is that this means temporal order is determined by a gigantic dynamic range of nearly 100-fold. And that is just extraordinary to me, and it's not... Mostly you think of protein kinase as switches, on and off, and that isn't the case here, for clearly, clearly the case. So how do you bring about such a dynamic range? One way is, of course, um, localization in particular places. Are there other methods? Another one is that when you undergo mitosis, you do it at a particular cell size. We've uh, um, uh, worked for many years on that. And so I think there is an input into CDK activity re which reflects how big the cell is. And I'd really like to know how the cell monitors itself, and I'm going to give you a simple model for it um, by the end of the talk, but we, we don't have good, um, good evidence for it yet. The third one is that that size is altered by the ploidy of the cell, which is ignored by most of the modelers. When you are diploid, you're twice the size. When you're tetraploid, you're four times the size, so you've got to get that in there too. So um, it, it, that's an interesting problem. Then there's always the problem of thresholds. When you go from a very low activity to 10%, it's a big increase. When you go from 70% to 90%, it's a small increase, and yet that's what we demand of cells going into mitosis. So how does that work? <coughs> and linked to that is dynamic regulatory behavior, which we are going to make some comments on. Okay, so these are the final things I'm going to touch upon, um, albeit uh, briefly. Now, the first thing we wanted to know is what components do we need to be thinking about?
And uh, we, what, we, uh, what we had available was, um, because we made it, was a genome-wide deletion of every gene in fission yeast that's arrayed in a diploid. It was 5,000 plus genes that had to be deleted and arrayed. It was done by Jackie Hales. I'm going to show you a picture in my lab who actually retired two weeks ago. There's lots of changes in my lab at the moment. Um, and she did it um, organizing a South Korean consortium that worked with us for um, quite some years um, to make it. And she screened it for all cell cycle mutants. Um, it took seven years, this project, um, and she's identified every gene in the fission yeast genome that influences cell cycle progression. There are 300 essential genes and 200 that um, are partially um, redundant. We also did a screen for what were called wee mutants, which are mutants which are advanced into mitosis at a small size and therefore define rate-limiting steps in the mitotic cell cycle. Um, and <coughs> Uh, Jackie, and I'll show this because it's a, a little bit more complicated to understand, used haploinsufficiency to identify other, um, other genes that might be rate limiting. And I'll, I'll explain it here. This is Jackie, who uh, taken a year or two ago, is just now, as I said, retired. And she is a, a geneticist, cell biologist like me. And what she did is went through um, the 565 genes that were involved in the cell cycle in the heterozygous diploid and asked the question, in the heterozygous diploid, were any of them advanced or delayed in going into mitosis? Because most of the time, if you're a heterozygous diploid, you've reduced expression level, not always, but most of the time, to half. And therefore, it's not a, a massive per perturbation. It's a significant one, but not massive. And um, if, it, if it has potential for being rate-limiting, then it will either advance or delay cells going into mitosis. And it's a crude, what we would call local perturbation experiment. You turn the rheostat up and down a bit and see whether it has any impact. This isn't the same thing as knocking the gene out, where you just knock it into a different part of control phase space. Well, she went through that and she identified 17 haploinsufficient genes that either advanced or delayed, most of them delayed. And here they are. And what was pleasing about it, because she did it blind, is on the left, she identified all the core regulators of the CDK system. CDC2, CDC13, uh, CDC25 and WE1, which uh, phosphorylate and dephosphorylate CDC2, SUC1, which is an interacting protein, PP2A, which is another phosphatase there, POM1 that we showed regulates all of these are <coughs> core regulators. So it did show that this may gave us confidence that the thing was, uh, was, was important. Didn't find anything else except what you can see there, seven genes involved in nucleocytoplasmic transport. So, and that had not been identified as a key thing, but obviously nucleocytoplasmic transport has a role here which we need to work out. And a couple of other genes that I don't begin to understand, uh, DEA2 and um, CCP2 over there. Then Francisco Navarro, another Spaniard in my uh, lab, um, a postdoc this time, went through um, Jackie's uh, um, uh, 5,000 or the uh, um, viable ones, about 3,500, and identified visually all the wee mutants. These are ever so awful experiments by the way, they're, they're terrible. You have to sit there on the microscope and just look at cells, and you're looking for cells that are 10% different in size. I mean, it, 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 they, they're heroes, you know? They, it's, it, it's not nice. And, but he got them. We, again, we got many genes that we thought were involved in the regulation already, and a whole stack of others that were not. So what that sort of gave us was a, if you like, a set of genes, and they're shown here, that we should be thinking about because they are potential controllers, potentially rate limiting, advancing, delaying. Um, and so, uh, and, and there were uh, getting on over 30, and we added a few more to make 40. Some of them overlapped. They were uh, WE1, POM1, and PPA2 all were found in both, in, in both screens. Because these screens are difficult, I can't claim they're comprehensive, because we will miss some. Um, but they but it's still quite a lot. And most of these have never been studied in, any, in this context. 
We have all, over the last 30, 40 years, just focused on the same gene, cyclin, CDK, we one CDC25, which we isolated in the 1970s. And there's a whole stack of other stuff that's um, out there. So what um, we decided to do was to tag all of these and then look at how they change through the cell cycle, just asking the point that the simplest model of how they would work is that the protein level changes. Okay? And this was done by Scott Curran. And we can use cell length as a surrogate for where you are in the cell cycle. This is the beauty of fission yeast. Um, and the data is just spectacular. You, you can look here. This is something that doesn't change. It's CDC2. This is one that does CDC25. That's Scott over there. And it's just fantastic. I mean, it's really good. So you can believe small differences. But the extraordinary thing was almost nothing changed. Almost nothing changed. What you see here on the left is a heat map. And the only ones that are changing more than 20% um, um, or thereabouts are the two near the top where you see red, right? Which are CDC13, and, which is cyclin, and CDC25. The galling thing about this is that we knew both of those changed. I just thought many of the other ones would. They don't. But at least now we did it and show that we don't have to think about them, at least in this context. I have to say the postdoc doing it isn't quite as um, sanguine about it as, um, <laughs> as I would. Look, however, at the, uh, the, the top right-hand corner. Um, all of these are G2M regulators. Okay, but at the top right corner that you see, oh, and the ones which are H are other G2M regulators that are not, um, haven't been identified by that sort of cast iron screens that we did, but have been implicated. But the top right ones are all G1S functions, and half of those are periodic. So there's a complete distinction. Those proteins that are needed at the G1S boundary are more sharply periodic, and those at G2M are not except for two potential regulators. What this means, I don't know, but it indicates that there is different patterns that these sorts of systematic studies get. Now, I want to, and we're getting towards the end, um, I want to focus on the two that undergo a change here, CDC13 and CDC25. And by the way, we measured the levels of protein by both uh, measuring it under the microscope, looking, by the way, not only the total cell, but also the levels in the nucleus, and um, because of the nuclear cytoplasmic thing, and we, where we see changes, as we do in 13 and, and 2, they are amplified in the nucleus. So there is something going on in the nucleus. And we did it also in a, um, a, 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 a fax-like machine, which is called, uh, called uh, uh, an image stream. Um, which allows us to do 100,000 cells. So the reason that data is so good is there's 100,000 cells in there. Um, and, um, it, and even the microscopic ones, there's, there's up to 10,000. Now, all I want you to look at is the patterns of CDC25. And uh, what, what we've got here is the nucleus on the right here, the total cell there, which does this. And CDC13, um, which you can see is sharply uh, periodic, just as, as, as we've known for 30 years. And CDC2, which is flat in the cell, but you can see is periodic in the nucleus. So CDC2 is periodic in the nucleus. And we have, if we count periodicity in the nucleus, we have a total of five, um, including we one um, uh, proteins. But I'm going to just focus on CDC25 and CDC13. CDC25, and this is concentration. This is the amount of protein in the cell. And you see, actually, it remains constant. And its uh, synthesis, or accumulation at least, I should say, to be more accurate, is switched on about halfway through G2. Halfway through G2. And I want you to, uh, uh, to remember that. Um, and this is just to amplify that. On the top, we have um, the, and this is actually in the nucleus. CDC13, and at the bottom we have CDC25. Now, what we have on the right was a, a, um, something I drew, okay, um, because I can't be bothered with PowerPoint, and so I just draw it by hand. It takes about two minutes, and it serves its purpose. Um, well, you know, it, my graduate students obviously sneer at me, but they take about two hours to do the same thing because they've got more time. Um, but, of course, we have to do something more professional, and they're 
brilliant at doing that. So what um, you see there is CDC13 increasing, um, look at the top, CDK protein level. Um, CDC25 um, falling and then going up. And we had this idea um, that to the left of the, um, of the red line, CDC13 is accumulating, and we're going to propose the accumulation is measuring the size of the cell. Um, and it has to reach a certain level to initiate mitosis. But the problem is that when you get towards the end or halfway through G2, you have to now initiate mitosis, but the level is not increasing very much more, so it isn't a good switch. So what we uh, uh, speculate is that when it reaches a certain level, it now activates the accumulation of CDC25. Now, what's CDC25 doing? CDC2 is regulated by a phosphorylation on tyrosine 15, put there by a WE1 protein kinase, and taken off by the CDC25 phosphatase. It is a futile cycle. So what we propose is that that futile cycle is off as the activity is going off. Then we switch it on and we turn it into a futile cycle, which is um, no good at measuring something like size, because it's going to be sloppy, but great at getting a peak of activity, because you'll burst. And you'll see that's drawn down the bottom there. And we actually see that, as you're going to see in a moment, that there's a, a gradual increase in activity, and then that G2M, there's a sharp peak. And that is dependent on um, uh, the sharp peak on um, uh, we, uh, we1 and CC25. So this is speculation. Cells measure how big they are by accumulation of CDC13. You can't believe that on this data. It's a speculation, but we will do things that will test it. And then you flip from a, 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 that regulation into a, an unstable, um, bistable situation which will allow you to um, get amplification of CDK activity. We can look at these things by having an in vivo CDK uh, at single cell um, assay. This has been done by another graduate student, James Patterson, in the lab, who graduated a year or two ago. Um, we didn't invent, uh, we invented it for fission yeast, but it, the principle was invented elsewhere. Basically, you look at proteins that are when phosphorylated or dephosphorylated change position in the cell, and they go from cytoplasm from nucleus or nucleus to cytoplasm, and you can see how that can work. You make it dependent upon CDK activity, and it means you can measure CDK activity in single cells. Now, um, James was actually really, really clever, um, but he did skimp corners. So this here was um, uh, simply five cells. And he begged me to publish it because he'd finished his PhD, and I did, but I was petrified that it was wrong, okay? I'm going to show you that wasn't the case, but I was petrified. So we only have five cells here, all right? But on the left, you have wild type, and we're now looking at CDK activity. On the right, we've um, inactivated that bistable switch by making the tyrosine not phosphorylatable. We've turned it into a phenylalanine, and look, you lose the bistability. You still get a hump, but it's spread, and it's no longer um, amplified. And furthermore, if you do that, and this is still the five cells, it might have been 10 in this experiment, um, that if you now follow the cells, you'll, if you look at the bottom right, in the case of the uh, uh, phenylalanine mutant, you'll see that you skip a cycle. The CDK activity starts to go up, collapses, cells are increasing in length, brown, then it goes up again. So you skip cycles. So without that um, uh, positive feedback loop, the cells don't, they, they get by a lot of the time, but not all the time, so it's a bit of a, it, it's a, bit of a, um, a, a problem. Now, it was lovely, but I, I was scared. So um, Nitin, who's down here, postdoc this time, came and, um, and developed three sensors. The one on the right, similar to the one James did, which measures high activity. The one in the middle, which measures medium activity, look how similar that is to what I drew. Maybe I was influenced by it, of course. Um, and then look to the left, which measures um, early activity. Um, and so now we can measure CDK activity at different um, levels with these different sensors, which uh, means we can look at variability in individual cells. And Nitin repeated the experiment, actually only a few weeks ago, 
And this is the wild type, and this is his uh, preliminary data with the phenyl alanine mutant, which shows the same effect, um, except the lines are thinner, so it doesn't look quite so pronounced as James's um, interpretation of it. So James is correct, and we will be analysing it. We're also going to be looking at the regulation at G1S, and we'll also be looking at the patterns and how that respects to CDC 13 to do some of the things that um, we... Um, that I outlined before. Now, I'm going to now finish, and I'm going to get to the end, because I'm going to summarise some of the things. I always forget something, so if you don't mind, yes, I found it here. Um, and I'm going to put up a, 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 a dr This is my dreamy crick slide, OK? What you have there, th this is the romantic part of London, taken from um, 1,000 feet, um, and this is the crick here, OK? Here, next to St Pancras Station, and it recedes as you go closer to France into the, the sort of misty, um, romantic phase at the back. And this is just, you can sort of dream about it as I just summarise. Some of this is, uh, as I said, speculative. So what would I like you to take home? I'd like you to take home that the core principle for cell cycle regulation is rising CDK activity, um, that, um, which at, at low level brings about S phase, at high level brings about mitosis that um, the notion that, and that's a quantitative um, model, and I'm going to suggest it's, the, uh, it's found in all eukaryotes. It is, however, there will be, I think, small uh, numbers of, um, a small contribution, I should say, of qualitative substrate specificity, particularly where you have a multicellular organism, where you've got to make tissues and organs subject to different regulation. So it's not that the textbook model is wrong. I think there is that, but it isn't the dominating feature for the cell cycle. And the reason why I think it's relevant to metazoa, and I haven't gone on that, and I realise I'm overrunning time, is because increasingly it's been shown that CDKs and cyclines can, are very plastic, can swap for each other. Um, only a, a couple of weeks ago, it was shown that you um, could make a mouse um, without... Um, the G1S cyclins, for example, it was, it, it's gradually, it, it gradually eroding um, that um, uh, textbook model. It is, of course, obvious that you wouldn't have many cyclins in the most early eukaryote. I mean, it, they must have been one that duplicated. And if you just think about that, it meant at the beginning it must have been something like this. And that, um, just to try and look at that, we're actually, uh, we've tried to predict what the original CDK sequence was, and we've synthesized a couple of possibilities, um, you know, in pre-Cambrian. This is 1,500 million years ago, of course. And we've synthesized it and now putting it back into fission yeast to see just how it's, um, uh, how it's regulated. I mean, a crazy experiment, but um, I thought quite um, in, um, interesting. So I think that um, uh, that is going to be um, the, the organising um, principle, but with variations with multicellular organisms. We need to find what is responsible for the CDK activity range. We need to know how size and ploidy is monitored. Uh, by the way, I think ploidy is monitored by titration out on chromatin. And we're, we, we, we show this, we, we've done experiments there to show it's associated with chromatin but we have to uh, uh, do more um, work on that, which, uh, by the way, when I say, uh, I mean the, the cycling is found on the chromatin. So we might be able to measure size and ploidy with the same component. I think that isn't um, completely, um, completely um, impossible. And finally, the dynamics is, I think, the cell switches to a futile cycle so you can get a sharp increase into mitosis, but it measures cell size before that by a more uh, mechanistic, uh, simpler accumulation of protein. Some of these things will be right, some of them will be wrong. And this is now, uh, we're back to um, the, of course, end of my talk, and therefore we reverse the logo and then it's gone. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>